I'm used to that. All right, so number one, all right, for the essays you guys are going to be doing, how does fate play a role in the Greek and Trojan warrior psychology in the Iliad? And why do you think Homer makes his character aware of their impending dooms? Matthew. Well, the biggest example would probably be Achilles. He knows if he stays, he's going to die. True. And that's one of the big reasons he doesn't want to fight now. Isn't that he, he was snubbed? It's, it's, he's also doesn't like, hey, if I stay, I'm going to get killed. Um, I don't want to die. And, <laughs> and that adds in more conflict. How does he know that? Because he's been fated to die if he stays in the Trojan War. Okay. Hasn't he? he was, if he stays, he's been fated to die. But if he leaves, which he may not be, even be able to do because of fate, <coughs> he'll survive. Okay. Well, he may survive. And what's the other reason that Achilles wants to stay out of this war? Well, he's been, he was snubbed and insulted by Agamemnon. Alright. Snubbed by Agamemnon? Michael, how is he snubbed by Agamemnon? Um... Agamemnon had to return uh, Achilles' slave girl to the Trojan city so that the um, plague would stop because... Uh, Who's Apollo, plague? Um, Apollo's? Yes! yes Apollo's, Apollo's plague. plague, good. Because um, the man whose daughter they stole from was a uh, priest or follower of Apollo or something. And a golden Apollo's. ticket, can anyone name for me the two daughters? Who were the slave girls that Achilles and Agamemnon both got? Leia? No, not <laughs> Leia. I think it was Star Wars. Persephone. No, that's somebody else. Persephone. No. Briseis and Chryseis. Not important information at all. Just wanted to see if you guys remembered that. But not a big deal at all. All right, so yeah, so we have Achilles, knowledge of debts, Nebeg, Memnon, all these reasons why he's not getting involved with the war. We're talking about here the psychology in the Iliad, all right? So how is Achilles behaving right now, Michael? Oh, uh, he doesn't want to fight even though uh, Agamemnon has tried to give his um, apologies with his... Uh, gifts. Gifts, yeah. Uh-huh, right. So we have Achilles who is refusing to fight, and what would you say is the basis of this refusal? Um, that he was disrespected and... Disrespected. Yeah, disrespected. So born out of kind of arrogance and pride. I actually think that he's... I personally think that that's the secondary reason, and the main reason is his knowledge that he'll die if he fights. Okay, so you... So you honestly think the main reason you would say why he's not going to go into battle is because he has that knowledge that he's going to... He has that clairvoyant message that he will die. Yeah, and he's really. using the, um insult of Edmundon as a reason to kind of say, hey, I'm not just avoiding my fate, I actually have a reason not to fight. Okay, so do you I, think... I the opposite. <gasps> I, I, I feel like um, he's just saying that, oh, if I go into this fight, I'm going to die, even though he does know that. I feel like that's a secondary reason. The real reason, though, is because, remember, he came into this war knowing that um, if he fights in it, he's going to die, but he's going to be remembered forever. And that's something that he really wanted. I mean, I suppose his wants could change, but I just think that he's mainly talking about this prophecy again just because he doesn't want to fight because of the uh, other reasons. Think about it though. See when you when you when you um your deaths when your deaths kind of fall away, you're like oh yeah, this will be a giant long lasting war. I'm oh, dying. Okay, and now in the middle of the war when it's wrapping up, he's like I'm still alive. The war's wrapping up. I'm going to die any day now. That's a lot more. That's a lot more I to mean, deal with when, it, when it's years away, what? considering that the original prophecy is saying it'll take five or six years for Troy to fall. Yeah, but in Michael's defense, I mean, the next big thing that's going to occur with Achilles is, I mean, what, what's, what's the next big offense that Achilles goes through? Well, he has his... He's, he, the next big event that Achilles goes to, as far as like fear of death, the next big thing he's going to do is he's going to go into one-on-one -on -one combat with the greatest Trojan warrior. So as far as, as, far as this fear of death, I mean, you have to weigh that whole thing. The next, the next event that's going to happen in Achilles' life is he's going to go up against probably the only person that anybody else thinks could kill him. And as you guys are going across to, Achilles is running with Hector. Is it Hector doesn't corner Achilles and make him fight. The stuff that's going to break down with Achilles' and his cousin is going to end up Patroclus. Uh, yeah. is end up going to cause Achilles to jump into this thing. And you're going to see that Achilles, you know, e even though we might see him being fear, and I don't deny that you're right, Matthew, about him having some kind of reticence about going and fighting because of this prophecy, because of the psychological problems mm -hmm. that are going to come from this. But you also have to realize that Achilles is going up against the only warrior who might be able to beat him. 
And there has to be some, I mean, you know, as far as having fear of death, that doesn't seem like the action of somebody who is scared of the possible death to go and fight the greatest warrior the other side has. All right? And when you see that battle, Achilles is a rabid dog. And um, another thing, on, on ignoring Achilles, another big thing is the Greeks are probably still only fighting because they think they're fated to win. Mm -hmm. they, they definitely would have given up by now if it wasn't for that, for that, um, pro <coughs> that prophecy they had. Right, to yeah, win well, the right. sixth year. Uh -huh. And that's kind of interesting because it probably means they will retreat no matter what the situation is at, if another year passes. Because they think, oh no, um, the prophecy can come true. A, a, a window of opportunity to win has passed. We need to flee. Right. And we have well, have a, yeah. Yeah, I believe it was nine years, though, after Agamemnon received the dream of the uh, serpent swallowing the, uh, eight. the nine. Or it was eight, eight and then. It was eight or nine or somewhere. It was eight and then they so thought the, the number's not all that important. Yeah, it's more yeah. it's a small detail. But, um, yeah, they even used that. Uh, it was uh, either Overseer or uh, Nestor who um, was saying when uh, everyone else was so demoralized that they were about to go back to the ships that they were fated to win. And, uh, that's the reason they stay. Yeah, exactly. And that's another rule. When we're answering this question, how does the how does fate play a role in the Greek and Trojan warrior psychology? We don't have to stay in Achilles. I would really kind of push you guys towards Agamemnon, especially as a character that we haven't discussed that much as far as being one of the heroes. He's much more of one of the kind of villains that we're looking at. But I would like you look, really like you look at Agamemnon because of the dream that we had that Zeus sent him, the actions that he took to do that, and it links in a lot with number three for your essays. Analyze the gods' involvement in the Trojan War, and what areas of the Iliad do we see Homer portraying human characteristics and idiosyncrasies on the Olympians? Constantly, right? they're treating it like it's, a playground, like it's a playground. Absolutely. But we see Zeus stepping in and engaging Achilles and sending that dream. That's much more kind of the first half of the Iliad, where you have a lot more passive actions going on with the gods, as far as them placing a dream here, placing a prophecy, or an omen, or a vision there. And as we're getting past chapters kind of five, or book five, we start seeing them have a much more active role in that. <laughs> if you're going to tackle number three in your thesis, in your essay, you definitely want to make sure that you have that part, that you have the discussion of, of the gods going from passive to an active involvement in this war, and the things that are going on there. And that kind of goes with the, um, the wars coming to a climax. Mm -hmm. but, like, the last nine years have been a build-up, now it's the climactic battle is coming up, and the gods all want a piece of that. Right. After all, they're going to be who knows if they don't even remember it in the beginning, but everyone's going to remember the final, the final fight, and they all want to be in that final fight. Right, right. And so we've gone through the, the, the psychology of Agamemnon and Achilles for number one and what that does. Let's look at number two, because we were already kind of talking about this, but this is going to be a huge point throughout the Iliad. And it's these two guys. All right. We've talked about the great warrior with the personality you wouldn't want to hang out with, and then the other really, really good warrior that is noble, honorable, wonderful guy. Um, and I've had a couple of my APs say things like, you know, why do we have these scenes with Hector where he's just with his wife or he's just with his child? And Michael had a great point. Homer is better at this than you would expect from an ancient writer. All right? Homer's not just going to have, oh, spears thrown here, or sword yeah. slashes there, or shield yeah. bashes here. He's, gonna, he's going to humanize, he's going to humanize his population. You're going to be fine. All right? Hat, 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 hat. There's video of this footage. Um, but yeah, but you also have Homer creating humanizing qualities with these people. You see him taking uh, Hector. You have, he you have Hector kind of being like, oh, Paris, you're such a coward. And he shows that it's not about this kind of nepotism, this family pride. For him, it's really about what it is to be a warrior, what it is to be a man, what it is to be stoic, what it is to be all of those qualities that the Greeks really pushed and wanted from their men. And that's why you have Hector I doing this. I want to he's Trojan. Yeah, well, they have to deal with that. But as you have Hector, you know, you have him, you have the wife thing, like, I don't want you to go to war, and Hector's saying, you know, I have to, I have to protect these people. You have that really pretty scene of where Hector is with the baby, and the baby's kind of playing with his dad, and Hector, the horse hair on Hector's helmet brushes up against the child, and the child's a little bit scared and doesn't know what it is, and then he sees his dad's face in the helmet, and he says, oh, it's just my dad, it's not really a warrior. That entire scene is supposed to be a very humanizing scene for what Hector, and for warriors in general. And you should be able to register that, as this is something, this is not just an epic about death, and the gods, and war, and, you know, people that look like Brad Pitt fighting each other. 
This is supposed to be about kind of passion, about a human spectacle, about it takes you through all of the emotions that the humans are going to be dealing with. All right. So Achilles and Hector, using specific examples from the text, analyze the characters of Hector and Achilles and how they serve as antithetical forces in the Iliad. All right. We're going to watch Troy. Call it. We are not going to watch Troy. It is inaccurate. You feel free to watch it on your own. You can just do whatever you want outside the class. But I'm not going to recommend you watch Troy. According to this, they, they've, um, it's approximately this, they've found the approximate de date of the destruction of Troy. Really? What did um, they say? Um, well, they, um, the Troy, the, the, Troy the, 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 the city that they think is Troy, they have proof was destroyed around 12, um, 1275 BC. Really? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's about when the city they believe Troy was destroyed. 1275 BC. And it does work with the um, kings that, that they did, <coughs> and men that they describe in um, ancient Greece existing around that time period. Okay, cool. 1275 BCE, where we think Troy is destroyed. Heads up, Mustang, this was a bad marker. Um, <laughs> yes, that was nice. Although I did say heads up, if he's with me. Alright, so good, so we've got that. But Achilles and Hector, alright? What can we say about Hector? He's Hector. He's Hector. He's Hectorific. He's noble. Um, uh, he's a noble warrior. He's the greatest Trojan warrior. I kind of see, um, this is going to be uh, kind of my, ga my fucking game, as a gamer point of view. Uh -huh. Achilles is more like a barbarian, the most powerful of, of all men, but, ex but so not someone you would want around any other time. Well, um, Hector is more like a knight. He's, trying, he's, trying, he's just oh. honorable and trying to protect people. But overall, if they fight one on one, the barbarian overall would beat the knight, for the knight's ability is helping others, not him, not fighting himself. So essentially, with Hector, you really see a foreshadowing, a precursor of chivalry, mm -hmm. or at least the concept of chivalry. The concept that yes, this is war, but soldierly and tactics and things like that. This all comes with the honor and the grace of what it should be to be a man. With Achilles, I understand you said this barbarianism, it's a little bit more of just Machiavellian, whoever falls underneath my spears falls underneath my spear because I'm the best. All right? And that's what Achilles is seeing. So he's a rank one douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The only, cares about, the only other person who really cares about besides himself is his friend.